Okay, um, this is the work that I did during my master's project, along with James Bryson from Oxford, Ashley King from the Natural History Museum, and Rich Harrison, who's at Cambridge. And the title is Constraints on the Ice Composition of Carbonaceous Chondrites from Their Magnetic Mineralogy. So as really well described in the previous talk, um, chondrites are basically these really primitive, undifferentiated meteorites that accrete really early on in the history of our solar system. And they serve as a good record of the dust, the composition of the dust and gas in the early protoplanetary disk. Something that's really interesting about um, chondrites, especially carbonaceous chondrites, is that there are lots of subgroups of them. So I've just put up a diagram here that shows a few of them. And each carbonaceous chondrite subgroup is thought to have accreted within different chondrite parent bodies. And these are all um, differentiated by their isotopic compositions. So um, as previously mentioned, there's the CM chondrites and CV chondrites, but there are also other groups such as the CIs and COs. So this is gonna be a bit more important later on. When these chondrites accrete, they accrete with a variety of different components, including chondrules, which are these rounded um, molten silicate droplets, the refractory inclusions that were mentioned before, as well as some metal in the matrix and ice. This accreted ice is really important because when this ice melts, it generates this aqueous fluid, which then reacts with a lot of the components that are present in the chondrites, to form an array of aqueous alteration products. These can include phyllosilicates and magatite and iron sulfides and carbonates and a lot of other interesting minerals. And the process of aqueous alteration is a really important um, part of the history of these carbonaceous chondrites because a lot of them have been aqueously altered. So even though this process is really important, we still don't understand a lot about, we don't understand a lot about it. <coughs> And so as part of this project, we wanted to see if we could investigate these aqueous alteration products and see what they could tell us about the process of aqueous alteration on these meteorites. What's really interesting about magnetite in particular in these meteorites is that it adopts a range of different morphologies. So I've just put up a few here and you can see that magnetite adopts forms such as plaquettes here, which are these stacked disks of magnetite, as well as these framboids, which are kind of closely clustered aggregates of small, um, less than one micron sized grains. And you can also see kind of smaller single grains of magnetite in the matrix of a lot of these meteorites. I just haven't put up a picture. So we can see that magnetite adopts a really wide variety of forms morphologies in these different chondrites, but we don't really understand why. Also, since magnetite is a product of aqueous alteration, it's probably affected by the processes of aqueous alteration. So we thought it would be interesting to look at the different range of morphologies of magnetite present in these chondrites and see if we could use these to look at the conditions of aqueous alteration on chondrite parent bodies. So just to sum that up, we basically wanted to take a bunch of meteorites, see if there was systematic variation in the magnetite morphology between each chondrite subgroup. And if we did see some, then we wanted to explore what that meant for the history and conditions of aqueous alteration on these chondrites. To do this, we measured a range of fork diagrams, which have also been mentioned before. And these are just really useful because a fork diagram is distinct for the different magnetic domain states that you see in different magnetic grains. And even more importantly, because natural samples normally aren't monomineralic and don't just contain one different type of magnetic grain, they contain multiple, fork diagrams are really useful because they can show contributions from different magnetic domain um, grain types. What's even better is that we can use principal component analysis to unmix these, and I've given us just a small example here. So you can unmix the different signals from different grain types 
that are visible in your fork diagram and you can identify what different grains are present in your sample and also how much of each grain. I just The example I've given here just shows you that in a fork diagram of a synthetic mixture where you have vortex state and single domain um, grains, you can see that you can, there's a signal of single domain magnetite as well as the signal of vortex domain magnetite, which is a bit hard to see here, but if you unpick it using PCA, you can see that here in, um, here you can see that the percentage of the vortex state grains recovered by a principal component analysis is matches really well to the actual amount in the synthetic sample. So that was kind of a proof of test to show that PCA works well. For the fork diagrams, we basically measured 26 different meteorite powder samples and two meteorite chips using an alternating gradient magnetometer at the University of Cambridge. And to measure the powder samples, we placed them on a glass disc and immobilized them using glue. So this is just a small schematic of how that was done. And we also kind of measured um, the magnetic signal of the glass disc and the glue separately just to check that we weren't getting any sort of contamination and it was very negligible compared to the actual powder. We also measured about 300 forks of each um, powder just to make sure that we didn't get a lot of noise. So I've just put some of the results up here, not all of them because there are a lot of them. I don't think you want to see that many fork diagrams. But for the CM chondrites, these are, this is a really interesting group because they are very aqueously altered, but also show a range of aqueous alteration. And so here I've just given a few. And on the left, I've given some that are less aqueously altered. And on the right, these are some fork diagrams of more aqueously altered samples. And you can see that there's a good range in the fork diagrams that we see. But you see that there's a mixture of these kind of single domain fork diagrams where there's a long clear ridge along the x-axis and these more stereotypical pirate hat shapes that represent vortex magnetite. So we're seeing that there's a range of magnetite grains present in the CM chondrites. For the CO chondrites, I only measured two of them and they both show this very clear kind of vortex state fork signal of these isolated kind of smaller magnetite grains. <clears throat> and the CI and C2 chondrites, which are very aqueously altered, they show this kind of more triangular shaped signal that's spread out and close to the y-axis. And these are normally typical of these clustered um, submicron magnetite grains that form these framboids that we also see in SEM images. So that was kind of the raw data that we acquired from the fork diagrams. And then we also did PCA on them. I've kind of split the principal component analysis into two sections just because it made it easier to analyze. And I split them based on the amount of aqueous alteration. So here we're looking at the chondrites that were less aqueously altered. So this is 1.3 to 1.7. And the circles represent the CM chondrites and the diamonds represent the non-CM chondrites. So these chondrites represent um, WIS 91600, which is kind of a chondrite that doesn't belong to a good group and is thought to come from a more distal region of the disc. So what you can see very clearly on this PCA is that the CM chondrites plot in a distinct region of space compared to the WIS, which plots in a region where the fork diagram is kind of indicative of this framboidal shape of magnetite, while the CM chondrites plot towards this kind of a bit more spread out along the y-axis um, MDN member and this smaller grain SDM member. So CMs represent a range. Meanwhile, the C2 ungrouped chondrites plots in a distinctly separate region of space. When we look at the more aqueously altered chondrites, 
including the CM chondrites, we can see again that the CM chondrites plot in a separate region of space here between kind of vortex state and single domain state magnetite. And the CI chondrites, which are a lot more aqueous yielded, plot in a distinct region of space separate in something that looks more akin to these kind of framboidal magnetite grains. <clears throat> So what we can see from the fork diagrams and the principal component analysis is that CO and CM chondrites, so these two subgroups of carbonaceous chondrites, show very fairly similar fork diagrams, but CM chondrites plot in distinctly separate sp PCA space compared to the CI and C2 ungrouped chondrites. In addition to this, when we look at the literature, we can also see that Tagish Lake, which is another ungrouped C2 chondrite, also displays magnetite framboids and has a fork diagram that's very similar to the CI and C2 ungrouped chondrites. When we compare this to SEM observations, we can see that in um, the CO chondrites and CM chondrites, when you look really closely, we can see that metal is normally the phase that is altered to magnetite. So here you can see that there's a metal with a magnetite rim. And in the ungrouped chondrites and in the CI chondrites, we can see that there are abundant framboids and plaquettes here. And it's kind of pseudomorphing this hexagonal grain, which we assume is a sulfide grain. So from all these observations, combining the fork diagrams and the PCA, as well as SCM observations, we can kind of see that there might be two different ways that we form magnetite grains in these chondrites. In the first one, you have CO and CM chondrites, and aqueous alteration on these bodies leads to the transformation of metal into magnetite grains that occupy a size range of just below 0.1 micrometers to about 0.1 to 5. So this gives you the single domain and vortex state magnetite that we saw before. And in the CI and ungrouped C2 chondrites, we see that it's probably sulfides that are altering to form these magnetite framboids and plaquettes, these kind of more exotic morphologies of magnetite. So now that we have a kind of hypothesis that there are two different pathways of alteration in these chondrite subgroups, we wanted to like see why this was happening. So I've just given um, kind of a list of reasons that we explored. I don't really have time to um, give you the detail breakdown for each one, why it isn't basically each reason. But we looked at a various um, range of things, such as how much weathering the meteorites have undergone, so whether it was a terrestrial process that led to the formation or destruction of the framboids, how much aqueous alteration these chondrites had experienced, what the initial water to rock ratio on the chondrite parent bodies was, so how much ice actually accreted to begin with on the parent bodies, how hot the parent bodies had got, so their level of metamorphism, um, the organics on each parent body and their composition, as well as the starting mineralogy that was present, so maybe if there was or wasn't metal or sulfide present, if that affected what was made, and then lastly, the fluid composition. And basically, you managed to rule out all of these initial um, conditions and concluded that probably the most likely difference between these chondrite subgroups was the composition of the accreted ice. And this is the thing that might have contributed to why on different chondrite subgroups, they follow different pathways of aqueous alteration. So I'll just quickly go over some of the kind of tangential evidence that we used to come to this conclusion. So when these chondrites accrete, as previously mentioned, they accrete with ice as well. And this happens at more distal um, locations because th that's where the disc is cool enough for the ice water ice to condense and accrete onto these solid parent bodies. Further away from the sun, these, um, the temperature drops further and other compounds can condense out onto the parent bodies. And the next one that condenses at appreciable quantities is ammonia. So 
at further distances, ammoniated ice can accrete onto your chondrites. We see evidence of this on distal, distal bodies, such as Ceres and Charon and Comet 67P, because we've seen evidence of ammoniated phytosilicates and ammonium salts on these bodies. So this could imply that the composition of the ice on these more distal bodies is different compared to the ones that are slightly closer in. We also see um, this study by White et al. kind of hints that framboids might require uh, alkaline conditions to form based on the presence of um, charged ions on the surfaces of these small magnetite grains that allows them to stay as framboids and not coalesce into one magnetite grain. And also um, the chondrites that we see these framboids and plaquettes in are normally the most distal um, samples that we contain. So from all of these lines of evidence, we think that um, the formation of these framboids and plaquettes of magnetite is probably linked to the presence or absence of ammonia and ammoniated ice on the chondrite parent body and melting of this ice and formation of an alkaline fluid could facilitate the formation of framboids and plaquettes of magnetite. So basically to conclude, what we basically saw is that magnetite grain size and morphology does vary systematically between the CMCO chondrites and the CI and C2 chondrites. And it probably, the magnetite probably formed during different pathways of aqueous alteration. And the formation of these framboids are potentially linked to alkaline conditions during aqueous alteration, which could be generated by the accretion of ammoniated ice on chondrite parent bodies at greater distal different distances from the sun. Thank you. Great, thanks very much for that. Um, we've got time for one quick question, uh, Claire. <laughs> uh, let's see, hi, right. we, uh, Greg, would you like to ask me a question quickly? So it's just, that's just virtual applause. It's not raising a hand. Right. Okay. Does anyone uh, does anyone want to ask a question? Yeah. Right. Hannah. Hi. Um. Great talk. I was just wondering, is there any evidence for like the mixing of the CR? Like, do the CI and CR hundreds always stay in the same position as they evolve, or could you get like a body which? In its interior has kind of one type of aqueous alteration and then kind of further out, maybe it's moved beyond one of the ice lines and then has the other kind of alteration like further out, or is that not really a thing that these kind of meteorites do? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it is a kind of an oversimplification to say that the fluid composition on each chondrite parent body is one thing and one thing only, because um, I didn't go into it, but on Murchison, you actually do see, which is a CM chondrite, you do see some framboids and um, that could just be because locally there are pockets of kind of more and less alkaline fluids that could facilitate this but I'm not sure if there could be like such a dichotomy within one body so the inside is kind of one composition and the outside is another only because aqueous alteration I think is meant to be quite a per pervasive um, Thing that happens on these parent bodies so I think that there probably isn't a spatial um, dichotomy like that within a chondrite but there probably could be pockets of different compositions if that makes sense. For the CR chondrites I didn't go into them that much on this talk but it could be like something near the region because you do see framboids, I mean, sorry, near the kind of transitional region, because you do see framboids and magnetite grains um, in them, but we can't really measure them because they contain a lot of metal, so the metal would just dominate the fork diagram instead. So that's why we haven't like actually gone into that in this. Okay, cool.